You know, I came here a long, long time ago, and I don't think I met any of you, but if you were there then, Angela Rao was my mentor at the Dana-Farber, and she had a trip out here. I said, be glad to meet you at UTSA. And somebody here was printing with an HP printer cells. And anybody in the room print with cells? Okay. So I remember thinking back then, when I had hair, that the best use for that would be to, instead of have plugs in a row, actually be able to print some hair for me. Um, we do a lot of regen med. And the goal of tech transfer, and I was interested in the previous uh, slides, the definition of tech transfer, um, cross out the word federal. It's really about cooperating parties getting together to make it happen. What's the definition of espionage? Non-cooperating parties transferring technology. And so we're the folks up at Fort Detrick who like starting companies. I'm addicted. My apologies. It's too much fun. Why? It's sort of like what uh, Jane does. She delivers a baby. She hands it off to somebody who has to pay for college. We really enjoy watching you not only conceive, well, not that way. And my apologies, I, I can't help it. I own a fertility company, so everything for me is about sex. And I'll tell you a story about that. We had a new colonel come in, and I introduced myself in the only way I know how, make somebody feel a little bit curious. I said, Colonel, I want you to know I just had another baby and he was really happy for me. And then I said, but it wasn't with my wife. And he's thinking, uh-oh, you know, in the military they can kick you out for that. I'm a civilian. And then I said, but don't worry, sir, my wife helped. <laughs> and he's like, what's going on here? This guy's going to be nothing but trouble for me. But uh, my wife's the brains, I'm the beauty of the family, and we actually invented a way to help older women have babies uh, with less risk of chromosomal aneuploidy for you uh, science geeks. And I'm a practitioner, and I highly encourage you all, go and try to start a company. Because when you see those sides of the problem, you bring that back in a way that really helps you communicate with companies who are trying to help you in your academic transition process as well. And I think that uh, division line between, oh, that's academic, there is no such thing as that's academic. We're all academics. We're all trying to figure out what's working, what's not working, what do we need to do differently in order to get a product to the warfighter, and in our case, dual use, get it to the US and world medical market. So what I'd like to talk to you about today are some of the IP kinds of issues that we get into. I'm not a patent attorney, uh, a caveat enter there. Um, I'm a business guy and I wanted to be like you. And I woke up in business school instead of grad school for uh, development of biology. But the science has to occur. And it occurs everywhere, in the shower, driving, our goal is to truly do what Jane does, and that is to help you figure out what you want to do. Bob was talking about Kratas, and why do companies like Kratas? I just got an email this morning from a company that says, yeah, we really want a Krata. We have all this background intellectual property. The minute we sign a Krata with that company, any new IP that we invent they get an option to exclusively license. So if you own a company, go do more credits with the federal government. They might have spent 20 million bucks previously developing it to this stage, but that last step is what's necessary for the commercial marketplace. If you're the company that helps create IP in that last step, you just benefited from all that previous investment and you didn't have to pay for all that previous investment. So Kratas are an incredible incentive to get companies to work with us, and the good ones, they already know how to game the system. They wait until we do the bulk of the work, 
They come in at the end and they say, hey, for a little bit of money, we'll get you across the finish line. Is that a good deal for the government? Absolutely. We usually ask them for a lot of money because the clinical trial expenses, you as taxpayers shouldn't expect the army to manage. It's much better managed in the private sector. And so what I'd like to do is get a quick show of hands. How many folks here are PhDs? MDs? JDs? Okay, MBAs? All right, we have got the best mix. I think this is the room with the least number of lawyers I've been in in years. <laughs> and I was told by the boss I shouldn't tell too many lawyer jokes. So I'll tell you a science joke in instead. Um, three scientists are sitting on an airplane. And the guy in the middle seat says to his colleagues, is it better to have a wife or a mistress? And his colleague says, ah, what do I know? I'm a, I'm a scientist. So why don't we ask the priest behind us? And the priest says, come on, guys. The Lord frowns on mistresses. Stick with the wife. Uh, up pops an accountant sitting next to the priest. And the accountant says, no, the wife's going to take you for half your own. Just get with the mistress now. Well, the other scientist says, come on, guys. You got it all wrong. You need a wife and you need a mistress. Because you tell the mistress you gotta spend some time home with the family. You tell the wife that you need some time for yourself to think about science. And then you can go to the lab and work all night. <laughs> so if anybody uh, is bored, we've got caffeinated gum. I only wish we had patented it and made some money on it, but we don't. What we do instead is make sure that all senior leadership, whenever they listen to us, are chewing this so they stay awake. 100 milligrams, cup of joe, it's on Amazon. The next gum that we hope to bring out, by the way, is not only caffeinated, but has an anti-plaque, antimicrobial peptide, invented by the Army, and prevents gingivitis. If it's addictive and it's good for your teeth, What's not to like there? <laughs> but that's an example of commercialization frustration. Not every baby is beautiful. As a matter of fact, some of them are so ugly you drop them. Well, most of the time not. By the way, uh, there's a museum in Philadelphia that has a cyclops baby skeleton. I only thought that was animals. Human cyclopses. Makes me itch. Um, why don't we have that other gum in my hand? Because to produce peptides, a 14 mer, by the kilogram, really expensive. You willing to pay $20 for a pack of gum? Can't get a commercial marketplace to accept something that's priced beyond what we can do. How do we drive the cost of a peptide down? If anybody has an answer to that, Come and talk to me afterwards. Wrigley wouldn't license our gum. I just saw, by the way, Wrigley has a caffeinated gum in the airport, but they're not making our anti-plaque chewing gum. So if somebody here wants to go out and start a company with us, please, we gotta figure out how to make affordable peptides. All right. So medical tech transfer is really an ecosystem, and you're part of that. The roots of tech transfer are the science. It's really critical that we water those roots. Federal government does a pretty good job at putting more in the United States water on that system than most other countries. And that is why our economy has continued to be so productive in new tech areas. I'm gonna uh, give you a presentation uh, that's not death by PowerPoint because I'm a Microsoft OneNote aficionado. How many folks out there are OneNote users? Get with the program, guys. It's so much nicer than PowerPoint because you're welcome to my OneNote content and then you'll have it. 
and you can edit it and you can reuse it. PowerPoints are stuck in time. OneNote is actually designed in our world uh, to be something that Bob can edit my content, you can edit my content when we get to that point where we've invited the public into it. But it also means that my slides are gonna look a little bit different and my apologies there. But our world is really about connecting people in a way that makes sense. And for us, we have to work with everybody. There's no single entity that can do it all. And what people always forget is it costs so much money to do some of the things that we have to do. For you academics, I have a, a personal request. Is uh, Patent Council, by the way, for UTSA in the room? Or just T2? UT Health, attorney's not here. Okay, so patent attorneys are there to help, just like we're the government, we're here to help. Do yourself a favor before you go and present publicly at a conference or put in a paper, an abstract. Talk to them, talk to your tech transfer office. Because if you don't, what's going to happen, sort of like what Bob was saying with the stents, is that not knowing what that pathway could be might be the end of the road for a technology. Fortunately, the stents, it wasn't the end of the road. But when I was at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, we actually had an inventor. He went off and he said, my job is to get tenure. And I'm gonna publish this whether you file a patent or not. And we said, we don't have time. You need to give us more time to write that patent. Now at the Army, we're famous for writing patents while somebody is on the plane on the way to give a presentation. If we have to in today's world, that's what we'll do for you. But please, please, don't publish without first asking that question. How much money is it going to take to field the final solution for a patient? And if the answer is, hundreds of millions to billions, and you publish, and we don't have patent rights, you've just doomed that technology to going absolutely nowhere. That's immoral. And I personally find that really insulting to people who need that technology. So it's not a matter of, you know, I, I apply for this, I apply for that, deadlines for this deadline. No, it's your moral imperative to make sure that if a patent is required for the investment community to put money into the clinical trials to see that through, that you actually participate in tech transfer. This is really what technology transfer is about. And uh, yes, that's Bob. And uh, my apologies, Liz Arwine is off at Madigan uh, presenting and uh, Don was unable to join us today. But we're there to help you navigate and to, when necessary, um, jump on the ball and let it roll for yourself. So um, I challenge anybody here, uh, free lunch, if you can actually name all of these brands. And why do I put that up there? Well, Bob already told you what an OT or an OTA or a POTA is. You think anybody naming that went to business school? Branding matters. You all have names. Some are memorable and some are totally forgettable. We have any John Smiths in the room? Nope, close. So how hard is it to come up with a name in the military that's not an acronym? <laughs> it's hard. But these guys, with a lot of advertising dollars, have taught you through the font and the color what their product is. If you could name all 26, then you're probably around 26 years old. You do laundry and you eat candy. <laughs> if you don't get all 26, that's your lunch. So this was my tech transfer definition that excluded the word federal funding. It's really the cooperation of the parties. And as you can note in the uh, sidebar there, um, 
in a uh, OneNote situation, you can ask us questions. You can have other people answer questions. So we're going to collect the wisdom of the crowd in our presentations, and that's the reason for us not to always use PowerPoint. We have a concept called assistive T2, and I got to admit, I grew up in the uh, early days of T2 thinking that patents and licensing was all that and the end of all that. And then when I got to the Army, I realized, you know, we have all these assets that we could use as T2 professionals to make it happen. And so we coined the phrase assist of T2. And it's really about the cycle. It's the life cycle that other people's expertise, money, opportunities can be brought in to make it happen. And I'll give you some examples over the de uh, presentation today. Prototyping is de-risking for investors to start a company. They want the least amount of risk and the greatest amount of upside. So at MRMC, we can actually do a full clinical trial all the way through approval if we need to. We don't want to because it's expensive. But everything that we do to de-risk it, like that anti-plaque chewing gum, otherwise known as Fort Dentricle gum, <laughs> or Perio Trooper gum. <laughs> and by the way, who came up with those names? An MBA? No. A warrant officer came up with those. And I told him, get yourself into the business world. He had marketing chops and he didn't even know it. So we can do many of these activities to help de-risk and move it not only through TRL levels, but into economic development and start some companies. And we need to start more companies. And we have some really cool mechanisms to do so. You guys are the base level. We can't start companies on hand waving. You've all heard of Theranos, company that waved its hands a fair amount, raised a few dollars, is dead broke. Science is real. Communicating science is a challenge. You as inventors, you know how hard that is. If somebody comes up to you with a microphone and a camera, and they say, tell me your story. Did they understand what you just said? If you use army acronyms, science acronyms, it's really hard to get your game on. And that's why we have some really specialized marketing people who can speak both sides or all three or four sides of the topic. But the goal, it's a product. And there are many products in the marketplace as a result of not only military medicine, but our collaboration with university military projects. The ZMAP antibody that was in the cocktail used on the evacuees uh, to the CDC was invented by USAMRID and licensed to a small company. And case in point really is a situation where nobody wanted to work on Ebola with us. Why? There was no Ebola outbreak back in the previous decades. And yet, the military has a special mission to protect the warfighter no matter where they are in the world and to make sure that we have something before it's needed. And that's always the challenge. We'd love to see you up there. If my wife's correct about her fertility therapy, I'm gonna put her up there. We had our first baby and think about what it takes to get the public to even know a scientist's name. Who are you? You're toiling away in your laboratories because you love science so much that you're willing to do so. A little fame and glory doesn't hurt. Don't shy away from it. Make sure your public affairs folk tell your story to the world. A, it's a great story that you're even able to do what you're doing but you have to do that translation. We were talking about TRL levels before. Don't say TRL when you're talking to the media. They don't wanna hear about it. 
Is it in humans now? Can I get it? Can I buy it? So TRLs are a dirty word, and yet we have to deal with them because we do grants, we do contracts, we do OTAs. But when you talk to industry, they're going to ask you what the TRL level is if they're a military industrial partner because they want to access things like MTech. So these are some of the inventions. I look forward to you joining the wheel, the telephone. But when you think about it, somebody somewhere forevermore will be contributing to this list. Could be somebody that you know, could be you. I like gamification. So if you can't get those 26 brands, then I invite you to try this Rebus contest out. And if anybody can get them all, then I'll buy you dinner, not just lunch. I'm a graphical representation of knowledge kind of guy. I was so happy. I went to a conference the other day, and somebody was talking about KT. Anybody know what KT is? Yeah, I had actually never heard the phrase, I'm a KM guy. Anybody know what KM is? Right, so knowledge management, which we do informally or formally without the acronyms. And yet, do we do it as well as we can in T2? The answer is not yet, but we're getting there, and we will. KT was knowledge transition. And it was somebody at the DHA level, a senior person, and they're talking about how do we get the knowledge from the basic lab to the advanced developer when all this TRL kind of headache is outstanding, are we talking the same language? Have they been looking in on each other's activities all along? Knowledge management and knowledge transition both can and should be a part of tech transfer and a part of all of our careers because we have to communicate and do it better. There was a Fast Company uh, article that inspired me to, I'm not an artist, so my apologies, to ask and answer the question for myself, why the heck do I love protein therapeutics when I'm never gonna get to the finish line because that road is painful. That road is long, and that road is really fraught with things that are going to put you in the ditch. So the next company I started after I read that article was a small molecule company, because those chemists, boy, they have it over us. And yet, what are we made of? We're made of DNA, protein, and yeah, we got some other chemicals running around our body, but the medical field loves a protein. Just remember, it's really hard to get there through the FDA with a protein, because what's your body do when it sees a pile of angiotensin running around your bloodstream, it goes and constricts or does something adverse. It's really hard to get proteins delivered safely, happily, affordably. And yet that's what tech transfer has to worry about. It's not just was it a good science idea, but can we get through the labyrinth? Bob has already alluded to our drinking proclivities. Um, we have to do many different types of transactions in order to get the job done. And these are only some of them. People keep coming up with new ones. But at the bottom line, it all comes down to whose money and who controls it. And we'll go through some examples of how does that work for the commercialization of your technology when you work with the federal system. So the first thing is that we may jointly invent, and you say, hey, Barry, you've got 20 patents in this Ebola arena. Our little Ebola invention that we worked on collaboratively with Usamrid, why don't we give it to you and have you license it to the companies that have already licensed in that space? That works sometimes. But sometimes we only have the little part and you're the ones who have been working your whole career in a field. It's not wrong, and it's the right thing to do for me to go to UTSA and say, 
why don't you license the government's rights? We were only one out of six inventors, and you have all the background IP. That's okay. Sometimes we invent with people who don't want to work with us ever again, but it's really important to the military mission, so we just agree to disagree, and we go off and do our own thing. That's okay in the U.S., but be aware. That's not okay in the rest of the world. In many other countries, both owners of a patent have to agree to license it to somebody else for commercialization. So particularly in Europe, that's a problem if you have a unwilling partner to go forward with you. So that's sort of the, the, the base model from which we work, and it goes happily both ways. But when people come into my office, and I'm not an attorney, by the way, they uh, ask me questions like, uh, hey, Barry, what agreement should I use? I have one of two answers. Would you like to buy the T-shirt with this on it? Or go talk to Bob. Because it's complicated. Follow the money, follow the IP. There are a lot of ways for us to figure out what way to go. But industry is always being started by newbies, folks who haven't been through this gamut. And our goal is to ease that. And if anybody would like to buy the T-shirt, I can't profit from it. So you may be the inventor in the room, and I know we have quite a few in the room. One of our goals is to always help you, but you realize you're still the most important person in the room for your invention, and you will be for quite a few years until you hand that baby off to a pediatrician. So. When you're out there, industry recognizes you as the SME. Not me, you. You're the most important marketing tool that UTSA has. And it's critical that you game, get your game going. How many people in the room have a video about their technology? Raise a hands. Okay. So uh, YouTube generation. You guys are a little too old. But that's where it's at. That's where we hope to get. Got two IV lines started. The Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, receives hundreds of burn cases every year. Many have multiple injuries, and nearly all require intubation so the patient can breathe. When a patient sustains burns to their face or any other part of their body, that area may become rapidly and markedly swollen such that the amount of space that's used for normal passage of air is decreased and the uh, patient is at risk of losing their airway. To prevent that, the endotracheal tube has to be secured in place with tape and a bite block. For burn patients with fragile, swollen, and damaged tissue, that presents other risks. And you can see at the corners of the mouth here where the tie could easily cause injury. Cuts from the tape lead to permanent scarring of the patient. Basic oral hygiene and other oral procedures are difficult to perform. To find a solution to these problems, Dr. Renz turned to respiratory therapists Gabriel Wright and Brendan Beely. I got on the phone and contacted three or four burn centers and they pretty much have the same kind of issue. We're a couple smart guys, and just because there's no ready solution out there doesn't mean there, it has to be that way. With no budget to work with, off-the-shelf supplies, and their own ingenuity, they began designing a better bite block. This is a commercial bite block that's available off the shelf, and we took pieces of this one. And this is a standard innovating stylet that was flexible enough that we could mold it into the shapes we wanted, and we just bent it around and came up with the configuration we wanted. Once we were happy with it, we glued it all together with some silicone adhesive and gave it back to Dr. Ren and said, hey, this is what we're thinking, this is what we've came up with, you know, what do you think? I think it's just a huge step in the right direction to make something better. Wright and Beely's bite block enhanced the security of the endotracheal tube. At the same time, 
reducing the risk of patient skin damage. Went from one bite block to two bite blocks and moved them to the back of the mouth to utilize the molars, you know, the strength of the back of the jaw. And we angled our framework here to bend in such a way that we completely avoid the corners of the mouth. What we use now, the points of attachment are coming right across the soft tissue here. With this, your points of attachment will be slightly forward so that as the ties come back, instead of coming across here, they'll be coming back further back on the face. Institute of Surgical Research is, is designed to be an organization that makes things better for combat casualties. Now in this particular case, this particular project, the potential benefits are enormous. We've got to get to a YouTube uh, generational uh, communication style. So hope you guys have a, a studio set up where your folk are able to do that. And I hope that uh, we get to watch some of them even in the grant selection process. Go ahead. We do have a studio, but they charge anybody who uses it and then there's no funding for it. So therefore you have technologies that need videos that can't get done because there's no budget. So okay. budget does come into play. So my goal is to have a studio and a briefcase and we just send it to you. And you've all seen the Blair Witch movies. I don't care if it's shaking. This was, I think, about $10,000 to do that video because we hired an outside person with a good voice. Why don't we at least start with grassroots stuff? You have somebody young in your lab, their iPhone video is as good as some of that stuff. The splicing and the voiceovers and the, face it, um, anybody who's younger than us can do that. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how to work with us, how to basically work the system. There are people in the room, obviously, on the act dev side, and they will introduce you to people who want to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. What you want to do is make sure that you go through the UTSA process correctly, that you work with the military in a way that does use the system to succeed. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a small lab and you don't have enough money to make that video and do the experiments that you want. And you're still waiting on that federal grant. And along comes a company and they say, hey, I really like your technology. Uh, tell me how I could help. Well, you can bring them into the fold by saying, you know, I've got this great idea but I really need some help inventing. You think they'd be interested in being co-owners of that technology? Picking up the patent expenses, the video expenses, the research expenses, but you gotta pay the piper, right? They're gonna be co-owners. That means you're gonna be in bed with them for the rest of your time. Is it worth it? Well, it depends how much money they're putting on the table. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So you could go to that same company and say, I've got the best thing since sliced bread. We filed a provisional patent application on it. Let's sign a non-disclosure agreement, and I'm gonna tell you what I need you to test for me, which means they're gonna be a pair of hands. They're not gonna be co-inventors, and they're not gonna put necessarily as much money in it if they don't have a financial stake in the ownership. But sometimes that is the way to go because you're not ready to be permanently linked to a company. This is where your tech transfer office can help guide you. But because it literally is based on who invents, who owns, how you communicate with a company can be a critical element in bringing somebody in or keeping somebody at a distance. So when we talk about commercialization, what we're really talking about most of the time is licensing. I'll give you a, a case study that uh, Don was gonna give you about what happens when you lose control of your technology. So selling a technology isn't really a good idea because it exhausts your rights. It's like owning a house. If you sell it to somebody, that's it. 
if you lease it to somebody, you can kick them out if you have to, but you can make money every year on it. And tech transfer is really focused on licensing. Joint ventures between corporations, JVs, co-development projects are more and more popular. Why? Because literally both parties are funding it moving forward. And it's not just you, it's not just them. We'd like to do more spin-out companies where the additional money from academia and government is supplemented by the ECDEV folk and by the venture community. And I'll give you some examples of how this works. That's how it works for us. Uh, but keep in mind that companies aren't doing this for their health. Partnering is really about making somebody else enough money to be attentive to your needs in the long run, not just the short run. But one of the benefits of working in the military medical field that we find is that so many companies come to us founded by former military folk who care enough about their brothers and sisters in arms to want to do something as a give back. And that's not meaning everything's free. It means that we get some preferential status in our relationships with industry because we're trying to do the right thing for the warfighter, and so is the company. When we license to industry, we get into a pickle if we say that's the only company in the world that's going to commercialize it. We just got slammed on the Zika vaccine exclusive license proposed by Sanofi Pasteur. Congress was asking, why are you doing that? Well, let me ask you a question. Anybody have a couple hundred million bucks in the bank? Oh, Jose, okay. Jose, if I asked you to fund this Zika vaccine and it's gonna cost you 300 to $500 million, would you want another commercial partner as soon as it's approved by the FDA to be able to go out and compete with you in the marketplace? Hell no. Hell no, <laughs> right? So exclusive is justifiable. It is legal. It's the law that we have the right to give an exclusive license to a company. And we have to, or they will walk away. And that technology won't be used. Bifurcated licensing. You saw that bite block? How many 3D printing companies are there now? Hundreds, right? Anybody could print that for me. But what are the odds that the company that prints it actually has the ability to go through FDA and regulatory or has the ability to understand the modifications that the military needs compared to a civilian hospital? So we're thinking more and more to get out of our previous box of licensing it to a company. Here it is. Good luck. Send us a royalty check and instead say, you know, sometimes, not all the time, we've got to bifurcate our licensing so we have a manufacturer over here and a distributor over there. Do we actually have any small business owners here? Small business owner? Okay. Do you sell in Korea? No. Okay. If I came to you and I said, I'd like the rights of distribution of your product in Korea because I have a group in Korea who's willing to buy wholesale from you and sell over there, would you be interested? Yes. Okay. So when we bifurcate our world, we could do that. We could say, we'll make it in your small US business and we'll help you find companies overseas who will distribute. Now, what the heck's the US government doing in this? Well, I'll tell you. I think we're trying to change the world a little bit at a time. We have trouble, you know, the auto injector, diazepam. If a company doesn't make enough money selling that, they go out of business. They don't want to make that product. So if your small business has a product that the federal government needs, 
and I can bring in money from worldwide sales, that helps the U.S. Army continue to be able to field that solution. That's why we're doing these kinds of things. So when we license traditionally, you always hear about patents. Anybody wish they had the uh, trademark license for Hummer? I do, <laughs> but those things get given away. We have one of the strongest brands, U.S. Army Star, good strong brand, but we also create a lot of other interesting brands, some of which are acronyms and shouldn't have been done, some of which Perioprooper for dentrical. No. Actually, we want to call that gum plaque attack. Hoorah. <laughs> so you guys know what the Marine saying is, right? Hoorah. And the Army is hoorah. Anybody know what DHA's saying is? Duh. -huh. <laughs> oh, no, that's on tape. Sorry. I'm a brander. What can I tell you? But we've got to get past our patent and licensing world. The world we really live in is knowledge. That may be copyrights, maybe trademarks. Frequently, it's about business rules. What do you think Jose's algorithms are? They're business rules for your body. People will pay you to access a rule that isn't just what Jose came up with in the shower, but instead what the entire Cerner Genesis electronic health record system validates each and every day as new medications come on board that his algorithm changes in real time. That's the world that we need to be in. We're moving there, but we have to be able to license that intellectual property, that know-how that we see we're going to introduce a new drug into a therapeutic regimen. How's that going to change Jose's algorithm? So the bundle of intellectual property rights that goes to a company really has to encompass more than patent rights, goodbye, good luck. It's about a collaborative opportunity. Absolutely. Good, good time to uh, get to the end. So when we look at companies out there, we consider, can they get us to the end? Do they have everything that we need or do we have to bring something to it? We typically talk to them about how they're going to do it. Will it happen in our time frame or their time frame? And what's the government consideration? We favor small US businesses. We favor companies that can work on behalf of the government as well as just the private marketplace. And face it, there's a requirement for them to substantially manufacture it in the US. Even if it's sold overseas, that's good for our economic base. So we put all kinds of restrictions on companies. They don't like it, but most human therapeutic companies also don't know how to sell to the veterinary market. And some companies just don't care about certain markets. And there are other companies that will step in and say, hey, I'd be happy to sell it in Korea for you. What's a deal look like? In the federal system, it's very similar to the uh, classic tech transfer from a university. But we also require those grant backs because we need to use our own technology universities aren't going to make a vaccine and inject the people down the hall. But our job to the green suitor is to have it made and inject people who are going overseas and need it. So what I'm gonna do is just say, it's not bad to be successful and have to call your accountant about what kind of taxation those royalty checks actually are going to generate. But what I wanted to end on is that the entrepreneur sabbatical program, which MRMC is going to stand up, is a, an opportunity for people like uh, Jane, uh, Jose, actually you have to be a civilian, but eventually we hope to get to the green suitors, who can go out and start a company for a year. 
And if they can line it up so they feel confident that that company is going to go forward, they have to cut the cord of being a U.S. government civilian and go off and be an entrepreneur. And that's our goal, is to do more startup opportunities so that not everything is the government or the university, but sometimes really the opportunity for the private sector to take some of our best and brightest out and do good things with them. So with that, I'll end. <laughs>